Information discussed in this podcast may be sensitive in nature to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Gregory Williams Harding was going through a hard time in 2014, but he was pushing through. Along with his partner, they were trying to start a dog walking business in San Francisco, but it was proving to be more difficult than he had thought. Money troubles continued to plague Gregory. In early October of 2014, Gregory came down with the flu. He was trying to stay home and rest as much as he could. On the morning of October 10th, 2014, Gregory's live-in partner, Samuel, left for work around 10.30 a.m. When he came home that evening around 7.30 p.m., Gregory wasn't there. Samuel noticed that his wallet and keys were gone, although he did leave behind his cell phone. Gregory was never seen or heard from again. Where is Gregory Williams Harding? Welcome back to the Where Are They podcast. The story of Gregory Harding is a real mystery, totally baffling, and very little information and news coverage to go on since he vanished back in 2014. The story of Gregory is also a tough one to research because there isn't much out there at all. He does have a Charlie Project profile and a NamUs case file, and I did find one Bay Area news outlet that did cover Gregory's story about a month after he vanished. But that's it. There isn't any social media pages dedicated to Gregory. There isn't even a Reddit or a Web Sleuths thread for him. Yet. Let's start with what we do know about Gregory Harding. Gregory was born on April 2nd, 1959. In the early 2000s, Gregory bought a home. Gregory was also diagnosed as HIV positive and was taking medication regularly, daily, in fact. Otherwise, Gregory stayed pretty healthy. While all the details and specifics are unknown, at some point, Gregory started having financial troubles. He would sell his house in early 2014 and move into an apartment with his partner, Samuel Williams. This apartment was located in the Civic Center area of San Francisco, specifically the 1300 block of Market Street, essentially right downtown. And Gregory was seemingly depressed with his financial state, and understandably so. He and his partner had also been working to build up a dog walking business, but it hadn't taken off as planned. Although they did have regular clients and Gregory walked the dogs every morning. Aside from his morning dog walking routine, Gregory was struggling some days to even get dressed and get out of bed. Samuel had been worried about his depressed state. To make matters worse, in early October, Gregory came down with the flu. Despite all of this, Samuel said that Gregory was still somewhat upbeat about the dog walking business and still got up every morning to walk the dogs. The Disappearance The morning of Friday, October 10th, 2014, Samuel left the apartment around 10.30 a.m., Samuel said at that time, Gregory was laying down because he still wasn't feeling well. 
Samuel told Gregory just to rest, but Gregory told him that he would have to, at some point during the day, go to the social services office to see if his disability check was finally available. Other than that, he didn't plan on going anywhere. Samuel would return home that evening from work around 7.30 p.m., and he noticed that Gregory wasn't home. Samuel also realized that Gregory's wallet and keys were missing, so he assumed that Gregory had likely just gone to the store. And since he didn't have a car, Samuel knew that he must have just walked, which is reasonable considering the area they live in. There are a lot of restaurants and stores within walking distance anywhere downtown San Francisco. But as time went on, Samuel also realized that Gregory had not taken his cell phone as he was trying to call him and find out where he was, what was taking him so long. Finally, although I don't know an exact date and time, Samuel would report Gregory missing. The search. The search for Gregory was tough. Where does one look? Friends hadn't heard from him, and I'm not sure about any family members. Nothing regarding any family is ever discussed in Gregory's case. That doesn't really mean much since there isn't a whole lot of information discussed to begin with. So let's start with the area that he was in, the Civic Center area of San Francisco, specifically Market Street. And we can narrow it down even further than that. We know his apartment was located on the 1300 block of Market Street. We also know that when he left his apartment that day, he was on foot and he took with him his keys and his wallet. The part of San Francisco where Gregory lived is pretty much a downtown area. San Francisco as a whole is known to be artsy, but this area of Market Street has government buildings with stunning architecture. You'll also find the Memorial Opera House, the Asian Art Museum, and several historic theaters. Concert goers can also enjoy places like the Davis Symphony Hall and the San Francisco Jazz Center, all concentrated in that area. I'm not a hundred percent which exact building would have been where Gregory needed to go for his disability check. But there seems to be several government offices and buildings in that direct area of Market Street, making it likely a very easy walk for Gregory. At some point during the day, Gregory was able to get up and get himself dressed and out the door. And he took his keys, meaning that he was likely planning on returning. A Google Street View of the area shows a very busy and populated area. And we know that Gregory left during daylight hours, sometime between 1030 and 730. But even more than that, if he was intending to go to a government office, he likely had left even before four o'clock. There's also a ton of businesses and traffic lights in that area which makes me wonder if anyone ever looked at any surveillance footage. I also wonder if by the time anyone took his disappearance seriously, if maybe the footage that they would have needed was gone. We see that in a lot of missing persons cases. If authorities or someone doesn't request that surveillance footage within a certain time frame, sometimes as little as 24, 48, or 72 hours, The footage recycles itself and records over it, meaning it's gone forever. And I did try to find specific data about missing persons in San Francisco, and I couldn't find any true numbers, at least specific enough to San Francisco. But why I think that's important is if there are a lot of missing person reports taken daily, weekly, monthly, I can see how law enforcement might not go to lengths to pull information, at least not in the beginning. And we do know that most missing person cases do get resolved, which feeds into the problem of authorities not investigating cases thoroughly enough in the beginning. And we are also talking about daytime hours in a very populated area. Someone surely would have seen him. Authorities in the area do report about 30 deaths a year at the bridge. 
But that isn't counting most nighttime occurrences when people might not be seen. So law enforcement does believe that number might be higher. But they've also said that anyone that ventures out onto the bridge, intending to jump or harm themselves in some way during daylight hours, is seen by someone. Did Gregory maybe walk away and decide to just hang out in the city until nightfall? We don't know. During the search for Gregory, one friend did come forward with some interesting information, as did Samuel, Gregory's partner, although their stories would somewhat contradict one another. Samuel told authorities that Gregory was known to meet men at Buena Vista Park for sexual encounters, men that he would meet online, usually on Craigslist. Of course, this was alarming to law enforcement and opens up a whole other slew of possibilities. But I have to wonder, does someone do that when they're sick with the flu? Or had he started feeling much better that day? Buena Vista Park, according to Google Maps, is 1.7 miles from the 1300 Market Street block. Certainly an easy walk. It is a 1.7 mile walk in the opposite direction as it would be to the bridge. But again, wouldn't someone have reported seeing him? I have to wonder if authorities ever canvassed the park to ask people if they had seen him there that day. Buena Vista Park covers 37 acres and is known for its views of the city and water. The steep terrain of the park allows visitors who walk up to the top to have some of the best views the city has to offer. This possibility also makes me wonder if anyone ever checked his online history to see if a meetup was happening that day. So while Samuel, his partner, told this story to authorities of Gregory having recent encounters with men at Buena Vista Park, another friend of Gregory's told a different story. He said that while, yes, he had known that Gregory had done things like that in the past, this friend said that it had been 10 to 12 years since Gregory had stopped meeting people there. So is this a case of Gregory's partner, Samuel, knowing him best? Knowing what his current habits were and what he did on a regular basis, they did live together. Or is this a case of Samuel not telling the truth or possibly being misinformed? Truthfully, we just don't know. I keep coming back to the fact that he was sick that day. But then again, I guess he had felt well enough to plan on going to get his disability check. The Questions As I mentioned, we don't have much to go on. I'm sure there have also been additional investigative tactics used, hopefully both by law enforcement and friends or family, but we just don't know all of those details. Which is such a shame because missing person cases can be solved usually much easier, much faster with the help of the public. One thought here is that Gregory might have harmed himself. He was depressed. He was sick with the flu. Two bad combinations. We know that he was struggling financially, and according to his partner Samuel, that weighed heavy on him. We also know that he was HIV positive. And according to Samuel, he had struggled on and off with depression the whole time they had been together. But if he did walk down to the bridge, it would have been daylight, and he likely would have been seen by someone. Unless, as I mentioned before, he had waited till nightfall. But then I also question, why take his wallet and keys with him? If his intent was not to return, what's the point in taking those items with you? Unless it was from habit, or maybe he wasn't 100% sure what he was going to do that day. I suppose it's possible. But Samuel also said that while Gregory was depressed and had a history of depression, he didn't think he would ever harm himself. He never talked about that. And Samuel never got the feeling that those thoughts were in Gregory's mind. 
And even though they were struggling financially, Gregory still seemed hopeful that the dog walking business would take off. But I guess sometimes you just never know what's going on inside someone's own head. And San Francisco is a large, bustling city. I'm not sure if there are any other spots within the city that you would go to disappear. From Wikipedia, San Francisco is a cultural, commercial, and financial center in the U.S. state of California. Located in Northern California, San Francisco is the 17th most populous city in the United States and the fourth most populated in California. With 873,000 residents as of 2020, as for most densely populated, in its 46 square miles, San Francisco is second only to New York City. That's a lot of people. And yet nobody remembers seeing Greg that day. Of course, they say sometimes the best place to hide is in plain sight. And really, I think I'm more likely to notice someone in a less populated area than I would in a populated area. Another thought discussed in his case might be that something happened to him while he was out. Perhaps he did indeed meet up with someone that day, someone that could have harmed or done something to Gregory. They could have even taken him out of the area, with Gregory even going willingly at first and thus not raising any suspicions of anybody around them. Although I'd also think that if you were planning on meeting somebody somewhere in the city, someone you were talking to online, you'd probably take your cell phone with you in case you needed to be reached or needed to reach them. Which leads me to another possibility. Maybe Gregory did leave on his own accord. Samuel doesn't think so, as he had no money and this wasn't something that was ever discussed. He just doesn't think that he would have done that. And unless he had help doing so, I think that would be hard for him to do, to go off on his own with no money and no resources. So what do you think happened to Gregory William Harding? Gregory was 55 years old when he was last seen on October 10th, 2014 in the Civic Center area of San Francisco. He would now be 63 years old. Gregory is described as a Caucasian male standing about six foot tall and weighing around 180 pounds when he was last seen. He has graying brown hair and blue green eyes. Gregory also had a short beard and mustache at the time of his disappearance. Samuel believes that Gregory was likely wearing a black vinyl jacket with a fur collar, a black t-shirt, blue jeans, and brown shoes on the day that he disappeared. Gregory also needs daily medication, medication that he did not take with him the day he left. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Gregory William Harding, please contact the San Francisco Police Department at 415-558-5508. Gregory's case is the second episode in our Pride Month series. Please share Gregory's story. Someone out there likely knows something. If you have any case suggestions or feedback for us, please email canwefindthem at gmail.com or send a message over on Instagram at the Where Are They podcast. If you'd like to further support our show and our mission, please check out our Patreon group. We offer bonus content over there along with some other perks and membership starts at just $3 a month. A huge, huge thank you to those supporting the show already. Over on Patreon, we just wrapped up our Missing in Myrtle Beach series, and we will be starting the next one, Lost in the Ozarks, very soon. You can find the link in our show notes or at www.patreon.com slash wherearetheypodcast. Thank you all again so, so much for tuning into the show today and listening to Gregory's story. 
We will be back again next week with another unsolved missing persons case. And until then, stay safe and hug your loved ones.